You know, he sung a line in that song that says, thank God my yesterdays are gone. And that is 100% correct. And I thank God that my yesterday, which was Wednesday, is gone. Somebody asked how I was going to work this in this morning. Because my sins are forgiven for what I said about our irrigation system here at the church. <laughs> that and I'm probably going to have to purchase a new shovel. Um, but, you know, in, in all seriousness, uh, our yesterdays are gone. And we don't have to worry about what happened then because God's forgiven us for it. And so we can look forward with hope. And so I want you to stand with me and we're going to sing hymn number 521 on Jordan's Stormy Banks I Stand. seated. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time together. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you. Lord, that we can uh, lift our petitions. Lord, that we can lift our requests to you and that you hear them. Lord, that you love us enough, you care for us enough, that you are interested in what we need. Lord, that you will meet those needs if we, if we ask you. And Lord, we, uh, we do ask you that this morning. Lord, that you would work in these situations to bring about your will, to bring about healing, Lord, for all of the ones that were mentioned. Lord, the cancer and the surgeries and, and Lord, families that, that have lost loved ones. Lord, that you would work in each one of these situations. Lord, we, uh, we just ask you to forgive us of our sins and, and Lord, help us to, to learn from your word today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so if you would stand with me and we're going to sing a couple of praise songs. We're going to sing Your Love, O Lord. And then we're going to uh, follow that up with a Revelation song. So let's worship uh, together.
justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow.
flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, our only wise King. and is and is to come with all creation I sing praise to the king of kings you are my everything and I will adore you with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Amos, the book of Amos. And some of you may say, well, I don't know that I've ever studied in the book of Amos. It is between Joel and Obadiah. I don't know if that helps you at any at all, but... He is one of the minor prophets. And so we're going to begin a new series this morning. And this is something that I felt like the Lord has put on my mind and my heart here for, for a couple of months. Is that we need to study the book of Amos. I don't know why he has put that on our hearts. But after reading through the book of Amos, I, I, I believe that it speaks to our culture today. It speaks about God's sovereign justice and how it will be administered and that there will be no one who escapes the justice of God uh, in the end because if you read through the book of Amos, and that's what I'm going to give you as homework this week, I want you to read through the, the book of Amos. It's seven chapters. It's not very long. You can read through it probably in about 45 minutes. But I just want you to acquaint yourself with the book of Amos because Carla and I were talking about this uh, while we were riding in the car the other day. And I do not believe, and I could be mistaken, but with, with my memory, uh, I do not believe that I've ever been in a church to where we actually studied in depth the book of Amos. It is not, a, it's not one of the more popular books in the, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. Uh, Amos gets overshadowed. Uh, he is considered a, a minor prophet, if you will, not because of his writings were unimportant it's because he is overshadowed by the ezekiels and the isaiahs and the jeremiahs who wrote prodigiously and so amos only has one book and so we're going to to be studying of uh, the the book of amos and today is going to be kind of an introductory uh sermon into the book of amos to kind of set the context and we're just going to cover one verse and so i want you to look at amos chapter one Verse 1, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, when he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of 
Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And so I want to, to look at a couple of points here this morning. This is going to, like I said, this is going to be the first in our series. And so we have titled this series, we have titled it The Not-So-Famous Amos. And the reason we've titled it the not so famous this this series the not so famous Amos is because he is not mentioned anywhere else in scripture. He is not mentioned anywhere else in the other books of the Bible. This is the only book that mentions Amos and it bears his name because he wrote the book. It describes the author of the book here in the very first it says the words of Amos. We know that he wrote the book He was a shepherd of Tekoa and what he saw concerning Israel. And then it tells us the time period in which he wrote. Now, Hosea was kind of a contemporary of Amos. They were prophesying at the same time, in the same time period, their ministries overlapped. Hosea was primarily in the southern kingdom, while Amos prophesied to the northern kingdom. And so I want to look at at the person, the the actual minister, the ministry of of Amos this morning. So it sets the stage for what we're going to study uh, in the coming weeks. Amos, it says, came from the fields of Tekoa. It says he was a shepherd. Actually, the, the, the Hebrew here says he was a herdsman. He was a sheep raiser. He was a sheep farmer. But then it also says something else about his occupation that he will, in in, in the very last chapter of the book, in Amos chapter 7, Amos says he's not a prophet. He says, I am not a prophet, nor nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said, go prophesy to my people Israel. So Amos said, look, I wasn't a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I was a shepherd and I was a fig picker. And these weren't even the good kind of figs either. These were sycamore figs. They don't taste too good. They were low quality figs. But that's what he did. He grew these figs. And so Amos is a person who really lived in obscurity. Tekoa was a very small village. It wasn't uh, a great metropolis. He was from a a place that that really didn't show up on the map. He was in an occupation that people didn't really respect that much. And he, he was a shepherd, but then he also picked nasty figs. You couldn't find a more obscure person than God would have looked for to go prophesy and tell what was going to happen to the Gentile nations and to the nation of Israel, you couldn't have picked a more unqualified person than Amos. He literally called this man from the field into the ministry. Just like that. And Amos was told to go. And Amos went. And you might be asking yourself this morning, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, has God ever called you to something? Is there something in your life that God has called you to? And and I get this question sometimes asked of me. How did you know that you were called to go into the ministry or or that God was calling you to, to do something? And I think there's a couple of different ways that, that people look at in a couple of different answers. And the first for me personally, personally for me, it was this nagging, constant, in the back of my mind, uneasiness. That's what it was for me. There was an uneasiness that I felt because God had, had called me to, to do something else than what I was doing. And I had my doubts about whether or not God was going to to actually go through with his calling. But once I wrestled with it for, for several years, it wasn't until I obeyed the call 
that I finally found the peace that I was looking for in my life. And before that, it was all uneasiness. There was a lot of, of, of going back and forth and doubts and all of these things. But I finally got to the point in my life where I didn't have any doubts anymore. To where God had, had eased all of my fears and he had raised all the doubts. And he said, this is what I have for you. And I finally accepted it. Now, I had a friend of mine who is a pastor as well. And he said when, when he felt the call to the ministry, it was, it was a little different than, than what I experienced. He was a very well-spoken, very talented individual, natural uh, leader. People gravitated to him. He had all the skills that one would need to be successful in ministry. And he felt that his skills were being used in the wrong direction in his business life. And so he felt this, this calling to go into ministry because God had blessed him with the skills necessary to succeed. And so that is how his calling came about. And so there's different ways that people are called into the ministry. There's different ways that God brings people to, to his side of the ledger if you will. And I would say that in my case and in my friend's case that eventually what happened is God left no doubt. He left no doubt that this is what we were supposed to do. Charles Spurgeon, he would tell his pastoral students, he would tell his pastoral students, and this is wisdom that, that my pastor gave to me, that his pastor gave to him, and that I have passed on to other uh, people who wanted to get in the ministry. But this is what Charles Spurgeon would say. He's like, do not get in the ministry if you can help it. It's exactly what he would tell his pastoral students. He's like, do not get in the ministry if you can help it. If any student in his room would be content being a newspaper editor, a grocer, a farmer, a doctor, a lawyer, a senator, or even a king, he said, go do that. He said, if there's anything else that would make you happy and that you could be content in your life doing, then go do that and do not get into the ministry. Why? Because the ministry is hard. Working for God is not easy. It is hard. And, and people who are called to it, sometimes they think they're called and they get into it and they find out real quick that this is not what they wanted to do. This is not what they had signed up for. They had the wrong idea of what ministry really is. And it becomes hard and they want to quit. And he said, so if there's any doubt in your mind that God is calling you, then you need to hold off until your doubts are erased. Paul understood this. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, for I, if I preach the gospel... I have nothing to boast about, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach. Paul was called to preach the gospel, and he understood that he had no choice. He had no choice. That God called him, and that it was his responsibility to be the messenger of God to the people that he sent him. Paul had no doubt. But when we look at Amos here, when we look at Amos... We talked about that he was probably the most unqualified person that we read about in Scripture. And if you read the, the commentaries that are written today, there's a lot of people out there who have the same opinion of Amos. They say that the prophecies of Amos are not as eloquent as the prophecies of Jeremiah or Isaiah. That... He was not a learned, educated prophet. He is described sort of like a country bumpkin, if you will. That's how people kind of describe him. That he is void of eloquence and that he is wanting in the embellishment of style is exactly one quote that I read uh, this week. And it is true that Amos did not have a lot of formal, he didn't have any formal training. Don't know what kind of ability he had, but we know that he wasn't in the school of prophets. He didn't go to seminary. 
He wasn't, you know, learned at the feet of some nationally renowned rabbi. He was a shepherd, a fig picker from Tekoa. But here is the key. He had the only qualification that mattered. That is, God picked him for the work that he was to do. And it did not matter what anybody else at that moment thought of Amos because God had qualified him to be a prophet because he said, go and tell my people Israel. See, God uses some unlikely people in some unlikely situations. You know, Paul, he wasn't the most likely source. As a matter of fact, Paul says it this way. He says, when I came to you, and this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, when I came to you, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom or proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. They even said this about Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. They says his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Paul wasn't a great orator. Paul wasn't one who would stand behind the lectern and he would wow the crowds and whip them into a frenzy. No, he wasn't like that. It says his presence is unimpressive. And his speech was contemptible. That means he was hard to listen to. Maybe some people thought Paul was boring. But you know what? Does that matter to God? Does that matter to God? Could God use Paul in the manner that he used Paul? Absolutely. Why? Because God is in the, is in the business of qualifying people, not other people qualifying other people. If you, uh, if you go back into the Old Testament... A few books, you'll read about another fella. And he wasn't very eloquent either. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Exodus, Moses said this about himself. He says, please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since thou hast spoken to thy servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth or who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it I? Not I, the Lord, now then go. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. Moses probably had a stutter. He was slow of speech. Probably stuttered. He was not someone who you would think would walk into the presence of the most powerful king on earth at that time and say, hey, you're going to let these people go. My God said, you're going to let them out of here. And the king said, no, you're not. No, I'm not. And Moses said, oh, yeah, watch this. And then time after time, he went back to the king. And God put the words in his mouth. Moses didn't have to worry about it. He even brought someone along, Aaron, that would speak for him. See, when God calls somebody, he doesn't care what your inadequacies are. He already knows them, and he's going to use them, as Paul said, to shame the wise of the world. He's going to use the weak things to shame the strong. God is going to qualify those he called. He's going to equip those he called. He's not going to leave you by yourself if he has called you to it. He knows what your strengths and weaknesses are, and he will overcome your weaknesses. You will not have to overcome them yourself. Just look at some more examples here. On the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, people from Jerusalem, people were in Jerusalem from all over the world. They were from all over the world. And all of a sudden, there was this violent rushing wind. And the disciples 
what? They came out of that upper room and they walked down onto the street where the people were coming to, to investigate what they had just heard. And all of a sudden, you have these disciples speaking in 13 different languages. So there were 13 different languages there that were represented at the day of Pentecost. And it says in Acts chapter 2 that they were amazed. And they marveled saying, are not all these men speaking Galileans? See, you wouldn't think that Galileans, that wasn't exactly the right side of the track for linguistic experts. You wouldn't think you were going to hear a bunch of multi-linguistic speaking out of some Galileans. They were not considered to be the most brightest bulb in all of that area. And even Peter and John, they were taken before the high priest and the rulers and the elders of the people. And it says in Acts chapter 4 that they observed the confidence of Peter and John. And they understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, and yet they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. They were fishermen. They were not prophets. They were not PhDs. They were fishermen. Untrained and possibly semi-illiterate. But yet they stood before the learned men of Israel, and it says they marveled at their confidence. Why did they have the confidence? Because Jesus Christ was working through them in His Spirit. He qualified them. They didn't have to qualify themselves. And so let's look here at our next point this morning. Amos, I've said this, was a shepherd. It literally translates to sheep raiser here. He was a herdsman. Now, we looked at David a few weeks ago. What did we see about David? David was a what? He was a shepherd. Shepherds make good ministers. Why? Because God knows exactly what his sheep need. See? How are we described in the Bible? As the flock of God, as the sheep of God. And so God knows what he needs in a person to feed his sheep. Jesus told Simon Peter, what did he tell him? He said, to tend my lambs, to shepherd my sheep, to tend my sheep. And then Peter went on and he passed that job description down to those who would come after him in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. God knew who he was picking here in Amos. He was picking a shepherd. Someone who would leave the sheepfold and he would go shepherd the, the sheep flock of God in Jerusalem. Because he was going to tell them exactly what was going to happen. Because God's judgment was about to fall. Even Paul understood the need of leadership of the flock. He told the, the leadership of the church at Ephesus in Ephesians. And he, he told it to them in Acts chapter 20. He says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds to the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So when we read in 1 Peter and we read in Acts, we hear shepherd the flock, guard the flock, shepherd the church, be on guard, watch out for the wolves, protect the flock. All of these things resonate. And Amos 
as a shepherd, would be very familiar with these figures of speech. He would also make an excellent minister and message messenger for God because if he cared for God's people like he cared for the flock, but God already knew that that was what was going to happen. But there's the last thing that, you know, so when we apply this verse, when we apply this teaching, and so how we go and, and we look at, at a passage like Amos chapter 1, verse 1, you know, it's not directly written. He, he, Amos is talking about himself here. He says, Amos, a sheep herder from Tekoa. So what we have to do is we have to take out the principle that we can find in the Scripture and then we can bring it across to today's culture and we can apply the principles to our life. And so how do we apply Amos 1.1 to our life? The first thing is, is that you've got to understand your calling. You've got to understand what God has called you to. You have to trust that God will equip you for whatever he's called you to do. And then when God has called you to a specific area, you have to take responsibility for that area and you have to shepherd it and protect it and guard it and nourish it and all of those things. But then there's the next point, and that is the burden. Amos had a burden that made him a powerful servant of the Lord. Amos was going to have to go through some stuff. He was going to have to endure some persecution, even some violence that was directed as he spoke the word of God. And he carried the weight of these difficulties with him, but he never gave up because he cared about the people. Paul told the Corinthians the exact same thing. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Apart from such external things, there is daily pressure upon me of concern for all the churches. You see, if you want to understand what God is calling you to, you've got to understand the burden that he places on you for it. And you know what Amos' name translates to? Burden. We translate the Hebrew Amos, it means burden. God had placed on him a burden for the people of Israel. And so when we look at what God has called you to this morning, what burden has he placed on your life? Where do you feel burdened for God's people, for God's church, for people that are lost and dying and going to hell? If you feel that burden, there is, a, there is God placing that on you, and he wants to use you in those areas. He doesn't care if you're qualified or not. Now, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. I'm not knocking education at all. I'm not knocking anyone who studies and gets degrees, because I've got a couple of them myself. I feel like I've been in college half my life. And it is important. It is very important, education. Because I think people should study to show themselves approved, a workman who can correctly divide or handle the word of truth. I think that is important. And people should be, be working to, to learn more and understand more and be able to, to have that scripture hidden in their heart. But just because you do not have formal training, you haven't been to a seminary, that doesn't mean God can't use you. As a matter of fact, he might can use you more in certain places than he can those who have the PhDs and the master's degrees and all of those things. When you look at who he used, he used Moses, he used Paul, he used Amos here. He used the fishermen. He used a lot of people to do wonderful things that we're reaping the benefits of even today. And not one of these men outside of Paul had any education to speak of. So the question is this morning, as we close, how can God use you? How can he use you this morning? 
How will you let him use you? Because we can all come up with a bunch of excuses about why we can't do something. Well, God, I I can't do that. God says, let me take care of the why you can't. I will turn it into why you can. But we have to be willing. Because God called Amos and he went. That's the most important thing in our life is we have to be available. Because when you're available and you're willing, then God can use whatever he needs to use to move you to do great things for him. But if you're not willing or you're unavailable, then God's going to use somebody else. And so this morning as we come to our time of invitation, we're going to stand and we're going to sing the footsteps of Jesus. We're going to sing three verses of this hymn. How will you let God use you today? God is looking for people to use. He wants to use each and every one of us for his service. Are you going to say yes this morning? And so let's stand. to be in God's house and it's good to know that he can use each one of us however he determines we just have to say yes Lord I am willing wherever you send I'm willing to go and God will use you just exactly the way you are today and if you come on something that you can't handle then God's going to handle it for you he will make sure that you have the strength to endure what it is he has called you uh, to do So, Jim Gabler, will you close us in prayer this morning?